Hey everyone, I'm Dana Cameron, and with me tonight are uh, Tony L.P. Kellner, aka Leaf Perry, and Charlene Harris, and we are going to be talking about writing across genres. I'll start with some introductions, just in case y'all are new here. Uh, Tony L.P. Kellner started out writing cozy mysteries, but along the way, she crossed over into historical mysteries, noir, urban fantasy, and even a bit of horror. Eventually, she even crossed over to a new name to write Paranormal Mysteries as Lee Perry, and now she's researching co a, a cozy caper I series idea. Crossing genres is fun. <laughs> <laughs> and Charlene Harris began her career in 1981 with the publication of A Conventional Mystery. She's since gone on to write urban fantasy before it was urban fantasy, science fiction, alternate history America, and a dash of romance. If she's not, uh, if she's not writing, she's reading. And I'm Dana Cameron. We're here tonight because I am celebrating the launch of my thriller, Exit Interview, which is launching tomorrow. And you can find it at any of your favorite bookstores or online presences. Presences? Online bookstores. Even better. <laughs> uh, and I've, uh, I started off, uh, as, as did we all, in traditional mystery and moved on to urban fantasy and thriller, horror and uh, Sherlockian pastiche and some historical. So we've we've pretty much covered all the bases um, amongst a lot of us. And so I'll start there. Uh, we all started out writing traditional mystery. Yeah. What made you want to try another genre? <laughs> okay, <laughs> one of you has to answer. At least one of you has to answer. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay, oh, Miss Carlo. No, no, Tony, Tony. Am I going? I'm going. Um, yeah, right. Well, here's the thing. I did not start out writing cozy mystery. I only started out publishing cozy mystery. I tried writing science fiction and some uh, epic fantasy, and I was really bad at it. Um, it was just awful. I go back and look now and wince, wince, wince. Um, and, but it was while doing an exercise that seemed to be taking off and decided to try to kill someone and write a mystery instead. <laughs> the reason that worked for me, so... <laughs> You know, it's like you can't, you, it, it worked out, so I didn't want to mess with it. So I'm going to always be killing somebody. Okay, so you started off writing uh, science fiction and high fantasy. Uh, what was it about the mysteries that seemed to work for you, apart from the killing that apparently appealed to you quite a lot? I think, well, the killing's definitely good. Uh, <laughs> two things probably. One was the plot structure. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're writing science fiction, you, you can go anywhere, so where do you go? Yep. Um, and also was probably the voice. When I was trying to write high fantasy, I was trying to make, do a bad imitation of Tolkien and doing science fiction. I was doing this pseudo science fiction -y voice. Writing a present day mystery, I could kind of write like myself. Mm -hmm. And it just, it came to life better. Very good. Charlene, how about you? I started with conventional mysteries because I knew the structure. And I had a, a kind of weirdly blind confidence that I could do it. Uh, as it turns out, I did I did start publishing conventional mysteries, and I did that for quite some time. But I really wasn't going the place I wanted to go with my career. Mm -hmm. uh, so I figured it needed shaking up. Plus, I was getting a little bored. Um, I really have to change myself around. To, I hate to say reinvent myself because I'm still the same person, mm -hmm. but I just feel like I have to stretch in different directions. That's kind explore of explore new facets of your personality. Thank you, Tony. I need to explore <laughs> new facets or uncover old facets, <laughs> <laughs> buried facets of my personality. And that really, to me, keeps me alive as a writer. I, th I think that's the thing. It's like we can have a great time. And I started writing, I started off writing nonfiction, which is a whole different critter, uh, working as an archaeologist. And it took me a while to realize like, okay, wait, I'm writing fiction now. This has to be an adventure story because it's a mystery. It has to have some action. It has to have a, has to have the arc of a mystery story. Um, but it took me a while to realize like, oh, it's not a dissertation. I need to make sure that it's a fun thing. And I'm not just like spelling out every detail of the historical uh, past as I understood it at the time. And it, that, that took a, a while um, for me to, to get the hang of. So uh, Charlene uh, and Tony, you had 
day jobs when you, before you started writing fiction as well? Did you have to change up your point of view or your attitude in terms of thinking about, okay, I do this this way in this world. Do I do it? Uh, do I write a different style, a different um, a different voice, a different? Is there something else I need to pay attention to? It as I'm writing mystery, for example. I had quit my day job when I started writing full time, courtesy of my husband. Um, the stellar Hal, because he said when we got married, he knew I had always wanted to write. And he said, if you want to, just don't get another job in an office, stay wow. home and write. And that gave me my golden opportunity, which I was a little bit scared of taking the chance because I thought, gosh, what if saying this for years, I can't do it. <laughs> But I could. So yep. that all worked out great. And uh, it was wonderful to have the the relief of not having to try to come home after working all day at a job and to try to think about doing something else that would stretch my brain even more because I was a terrible employee. So I, I, you can't leave it there. I mean, how terrible were you? In what way were you oh, terrible? Pretty terrible because I was judgy. I was very judgy because <laughs> uh, uh, people would tell me to do things and I would think, you're so dumb. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I was just really judgy because I was really well educated in it and I was a bit intelligent. But these people actually knew how to do stuff. <laughs> I did not know how. So I should have kept my little judginess to myself. This, is, <laughs> this seems to be tell all time. I gotcha. Tony, you started, I think, writing uh, doc software for uh, documentary. Um, software writing. documentation, yes. Yes. I was writing. Um, when I first started, what became my first book, I was working writing, um, let's see, was that banking automation software? Oh, wow. And then I moved to capacity planning software as I continued on. I think by the time it came out, I was in capacity planning software, which I'm not going to explain because it's really boring and I don't want to put anyone to sleep. Um, it actually wasn't as different as you might think. Because when you're when you're a tech writer and you're writing, you go around and you question your, you know, some, you start out with a mystery, which is, what does this do? And then you go and talk to your subject matter experts who are kind of like suspects. So you question them, you take notes. <laughs> and, and they tell you they forget to tell you things and they lie to you just like oh. in a mystery. <laughs> and then when you're done it's still a mystery what the heck this product is so it's pretty much the same thing except oh. for dead bodies <laughs> fewer in the non in your real life day job I'm except assuming. when i was doing hospital information systems there might have been some dead bodies involved in that <laughs> we're gonna Not leave that right <laughs> we're gonna leave that there for well, for purposes <laughs> Um, so what made you decide to start writing something different after traditional mystery? Charlene, you'd mentioned something about wanting to explore different, different facets of yourself, uh, to stretch yourself as a writer. Uh, was there something in particular that, um, said, yeah, this is what I want to do. This is what I want to do now. And here's why. Tony. She asked you. She uh, asked you. Lane. She, she retreaded what I had said as a segue to getting you to give her the same. <laughs> <laughs> it's because it was my way of sneaking back over towards science fiction and fantasy. It's like, well, and I, at that point I was reading a lot of urban fantasy. Um, I read Laurel Hamilton, Charlene, of course, and a lot of things. It's like, I, I want to play there. I want to play with that. So what I got an opportunity when um, Charlene and I were doing the, we did a series of anthologies together of urban fantasy anthologies. And I, you know, when Charlene drafted me, I mean, excuse me, invited me to, to edit with her. Co -edit. <laughs> and I said, do I get to write a story too? And, and the, uh, the guys who were inquiring, it's like, sure, you can do whatever you want. It's like, okay. And it felt like this was permission to do something, but I just still made it into a mystery. I just had the, you know, that the sleuths were vampires and, trying to find a lost grave now but you know it, it just felt like I got permission to play and I liked reading them so much I wanted to play in that sandbox too nice nice what was it about Stella 
Inst was it Stella got her grave back was the first one? Yeah, how Stella got her grave back was the first one. Um, I, I was trying to, because I've read, the, the, the problem when you're reading so much in a genre, subgenre, is you see what these other people who've done, and it's so good. It's like, dude, what am I going to do? Yep. So so what I tried to do is come up with a twist, and my twist, my two twists were one was that, um, is that instead of being born with a certain powers, mm -hmm. that you, you start out as a baby vampire, you don't have sleep all during the day you can go out during the day a little if you use a lot of sunscreen yeah. um and you don't eat little food but some blood and you can't mesmerize worth a darn until you're older um so i kind of baby vampire kind of learning his way of how to be a vampire the other thing instead of having it in a more glamorous location um i had it set around a chicken farm chicken farms are the smelliest things on earth my grandparents had a chicken farm, which I didn't get to, didn't have to go to very often, thank goodness. But my grandmother's like, I can never eat chicken again for the rest of my life because of smelling that chicken farm so much. I thought, that's a glamorous place for a vampire. <laughs> <laughs> so I really kind of, I set it near Raleigh, North Carolina, where my family's from. I set it in, the, the grave was in a little family cemetery, which is where a lot of my relatives are buried. And just kind of pulling together, my, still using the kind of the Southern background I used in my, um, Laura Fleming series, but then throwing in the vampires. Yep. I sneak up on things. There you go. And Charlene, you've, you've changed genres a, a, a number of times. What makes you decide to say, okay, this is what I'm going to focus on now. What is it that's new or different that you want to explore? Um, I just always feel the need to change things around and try writing something different from what I've been writing because it just it renews my interest in, in what I'm doing and it gives me more impetus to actually get into it and work out the world and uh, find out what my protagonist is doing in that world. Really, mm -hmm. I come up with the protagonist first and then create the world that has she has to have to support what I want her to do, which in the Gunny Rose case is just shoot lots and lots of people. Yeah, I, I, I feel that. I feel that. Um, for me, it was, I mean, obviously, I think everyone knows the story that it was because of, of you two inviting me to write a werewolf story that I started with the Fangborn books um, and had so much fun <laughs> writing the short stories that I just, I couldn't stop writing the short stories. And eventually, I had enough awareness of the world and how I wanted to go through it uh, with Zoe Miller, uh, who was a werewolf who doesn't know she's a werewolf, but is an archaeologist and sort of takes apart their culture by looking at them as an archaeologist might, um, and to write the novels. And what I realized in writing the Emma books, the Emma Fielding mysteries, was that I loved writing action scenes. But within a traditional mystery, you have plenty of scope for that, but it has to be of a certain nature. Because, I mean, if you go with the sort of traditional definition of the blood is dried on the library floor before the book starts or before the characters introduce um, you're not going to have a lot of on-screen violence and such but I really got to loving writing the action scenes and I started because I realized I didn't want Emma to get you know coshed on the head I wanted to have her have a way of protecting herself I started studying mixed martial arts and then I um, just got more and more into the idea of physical fighting and how could I incorporate that into the writing so from the Fangborn books, that was easy because I started watching how I watched watching documentaries about how wolves and other animals behave when they're going to be attacked or they are attacking and uh, going to a wolf sanctuary nearby to watch how they behave to get the uh, physicality of it down. But then I'm like, yeah, I just want to a thriller because, uh, as you said, Charlene, uh, in an in exit interview, I, I just got to know Jane through writing short stories. And she had a, I won't say devil may care, but she had a confidence about her that I found really attractive. And so that was sort of the segue for the, the pathway for me was to go from, um, from writing action scenes, to like, like how much action can we put into something at once? And that's what I want to do with next interview. <coughs> Oops, excuse me. No problem. Um, when uh, what challenges do you encounter, or what what are the what is your best advice for people who are changing a, genres that they have written in before? What is your best advice for them to think about uh, things to think about when they are changing? For example, I, I've been thinking <laughs> about the change in stakes with the difference between a traditional mystery and a thriller. 
the stakes might be limited to a community or a neighborhood or just a handful of people in a traditional mystery. But with yep. a thriller, depending on the kind of thriller, it could be something that, you know, is goes up to and including, you know, planetary uh, destruction. So uh, what, what kind of what kind of things do you would you encourage folks to think about when they're changing a different genre? If they're going to include supernatural creatures, that is going to change the whole tone of the story and introduce a lot of factors that aren't in a regular uh, conventional mystery. Mm -hmm. There's I'm a not afraid to state the obvious. Yeah, well, well, it's, it's a world Yeah, it's um, it's a, it is a um. You have to scale things up. You have to make sure that there are vulnerabilities, I think, if you're dealing with supernatural characters. Yeah. Um, and you have to make sure they have worthy enough uh, antagonists, I think, to take yeah. them on if they have supernatural powers. Um, I guess part of it was realizing that I could use, when I started writing the Emma books, um, I used the word guts, talking about a human's insides. And my editor, and quite rightly so, said, no, you can't. You can't say that because it's too much. It's, and I realized, oh, like she's not talking that I can't have the idea of someone being grievously wounded there. I just have to change the language so it's not quite so direct. And I think that might be part of it too. Or do you think that she was wrong and I just should have said guts? That's an I, interesting point. I don't yeah. Know. Depends on how it read after you finished. What was the result you were looking for? And what's where you were to go, book. you know, guts was right. This is where you're in the books. This is like if you've got to say it, you know, saying, So, what happened to the, you know, what happened? And it's like, Well, I was seeing this, and man was shot, it was very awful, and his guts were hanging out. Then it might not fit. But if you're in the middle of the action and he sees it and you want to express the horrifying, yes, guts would totally work. It, it was, uh, she was quite vehement about that particular word. So I, I took it out and I, I was able to work around it, but I used the word, I'm, I'm quite horrified to say that I used that word in a different context in every book I did, just because, <laughs> like, it took guts to do that. It's like, well, say, yeah. move, you may. Actually, I was thinking as we were talking about how we kind of moved in from, from uh, traditional mysteries into the paranormal, one thing that all three of us did. I think was pulled on something that we had that worked for us in our original series. I always said that I liked when I wrote my first mystery, it was set in a, a location I knew very well. So I didn't have to worry about setting so much. I had that in my head. I had the kinds of people and the way they spoke. So I could really concentrate on creating a mystery plot. So, you know, so when you're, when you're changing genres, you don't want to have to redo everything. You want to build on your strengths. Yeah. So Dana started with arch with archaeology. And then built the whole Zoe mythos with that. Charlene and I both went back Southern in order, because we were both Southerners writing in Southern milieus. So it's like, okay, we, we've got the Southern down pot. Now we just have to add a little bit. Rather than a whole new cake, we just added a new flavor. Yeah, I think um, Ooh, it's I one like of those that. things. Yeah. <laughs> we're going to steal that from you, Tony. <laughs> um, uh, I, I think you're right. I think that is like, uh, it's like when you're, when you're, when you're writing fiction, you're writing something that didn't happen, but as long as you keep most of it realistic, you can get away with adding supernatural characters with characters with uh, better than average abilities, that kind of thing, because it will fit better. And I think, I think you're right. We go to our comfort places like to, to, to fill up the world and then we can say, okay, this much is true. This is, this is all real. And then we bring in our, you know, hypernaturally or supernaturally or just, above average uh talented uh talented creatures yeah or characters sometimes they're called characters um let's let's talk about short stories for a second because oh um, what a coincidence what a coincidence yes i was just gonna say you two have no idea how challenging it is to have you for friends since you have both won awards for your short stories and I'm still laboring in the trenches. You have edited short stories that were nominated and won awards. Uh, mm, that's not quite as firsthand as I want to be. 
take the plus, take the win. <laughs> yeah, okay. Thank you, Tony. <laughs> I, I hear that, but you have you've won the Anthony for and the and the and the uh, Agatha for uh, uh, novels, correct? No, she's won an Anthony, but not an Agatha yet. Not an Agatha. I got the lifetime. Oh, I got lifetime achievement. Oh, my bad, my bad. And I got the Edgar for lifetime achievement. And I'm going, but it would be nice to get one for the actual work that many, life many, <laughs> many of the MWA grandmasters have not won Edgar's. Mm -hmm. and that's Did you make that up? Because I think it's great. <laughs> it's true. Um, it's it's true? Oh, yeah, it's true. Oh, you can have look at the list. Lots of them have never won Edgar's. And a lot of the people who won Edgar's, you know, frankly, didn't have very long careers. They maybe did an excellent work. You know, an excellent short story, an excellent novel, a, a great first novel, and you never hear from them again. That's why you're such a good friend, Tony. <laughs> well, speaking for myself as a reader, I'd much rather have someone who has a long career because I want to keep reading all your stuff. You've got it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I feel like I'm touching on a sore subject now, Charlene, but since you've enabled so many other writers to come up with different careers by writing short stories. I think you also have to take that. And Tony, you have to take that to heart. Um, you know, how many different series have you, uh, have you godmothered? Oh, so to speak? that is a good idea. Four? At uh, least. At four. least. Yeah. Uh, S.J. Roseanne return, return, not based on her story she did for us, but remembered her love for fantasy and science fiction and did three books as uh, and her two or three books in her vampire series. Uh -huh. Sam Pabot. <laughs> so, yeah. Sam Pabot. I can't remember the name. Mike yeah. Carey. Yeah. Mike Carey, who did a short story for us in Creature, An Apple for the Creature, which yep. got made for an Edgar of all things. Um, and, and was made into the movie The Girl with All the Gifts, which was, was a short story yeah. to novel, then to the movie, and then a sequel novel. <gasps> yeah. Oh, I did not know about that. Oh, yeah. There's a sequel novel. Uh, yep. yep and, there it is. He's yeah. our, and Alan he's Gordon, so good. Gosh, he's good. Oh, so good. But Alan yeah. Gordon wrote a novel based on his short story that he did, which was quite good, also. And mm -hmm. I think someone else. I think someone. I'm trying to remember who. Someone more on the the paranormal romance side did a novella based on the character she created to use in our book, and then you know, it was part of her world. Mm -hmm. She did more with those characters, but I can't remember who which one it was. Well, we've been lucky to godmother a lot. Yeah, we yeah. I, I consider y'all my fangy godmothers as well. Uh, but so I was talking about short stories in terms of do you use them to try out a new idea and a new genre, or do you take a series character and do something different with them in short stories? And I just like the idea of bringing up a short story because it is such a different creature. As I said, not quite a different genre, but it's a different creature than um, than a novel. So do you do you tr do you test run characters first? Or do you yeah. move them back and forth? I do. That was how I came up with Gunny Rose. Uh, I wrote the short story about her for a charity anthology that Sean Speakman edited. And I thought, I'm really on to something now. But I had to create the world, which took a lot of doing, because she had to be able to kill a lot of people and not get arrested. <laughs> so I had, that was the the basis for the whole world and now i'm on book i'm gonna start book six if i ever wow. yeah yeah and that, that will probably be the final book mm -hmm. uh, for gunny and her sister but i love to test drive ideas and there are some characters i only use in short stories like Ann DeWitt. Like Ann DeWitt. I was going to say, I was wondering whether you were going to come up with a novel based on, um, you know, the small kingdoms. I don't think I will. Is it just too intense or just not your not your jam? You like to be with her for a little while? That's pretty much it, I think. The, I, could, I, don't, I like Ann, but there are only so many times she can uh, participate in murder in her own school. And I can't see her going on vacation. <laughs> <laughs> so there are practicalities to consider in these things. She could go to an academic conference, I suppose. Definitely. 
Oh, it's she'd be so popular there. <laughs> I there are there's plenty of fodder for um, yeah. mystery and mayhem at an academic conference. I think all three of us could speak to that. Um, Tony, I was wondering. Uh, I know you've done some of the short stories from the Laura Fleming uh, verse. Yeah, I and tend to go backwards, start with the novels, and then pull out characters that I want to spend more time with. And I'm actually working on one now using the um, using a character from a short story and then uh, Junior Norton, who was the chief of police in the Laura Fleming series, putting them together to see how that works out. Oh, hey. I was thinking about um, your award-winning short story, uh, Bible Belt, and was wondering if that was, that felt darker to me than many of your Laura Fleming books? And it was written um, a long time ago. Yeah, it was a lot darker, and it got darker every time I rewrote it, because it, it was one of those that I wrote and then had to rewrite and rewrite kind of thing before it finally got publishable. Um, yeah, I don't usually go that dark. I don't usually go that dark for very long. I can do it in a short story. Um, I've done horror, and I've done noir, and I've done a short story, but I just... I don't know, my sense of humor comes out or I just get squigged out or, or a combination thereof. Right. I was trying to think whether we saw Sid to begin with, uh, Sid, the, the walking, talking skeleton, the hero protagonist of, or co-protagonist of the uh, the family skeleton um, mysteries, whether he debuted in the short story first? No, he did not. He debuted on as a novel. I, I have published a short story with him now. There was one that came out in the fall in Ellery Queen Mystery Magazine. But it was hard writing him as a short story because mm. I'm like, you know, you can say vampire and people know kind of what you're talking about and werewolf. And, I, and I'm and i sure you've run into that with the Fameborn because you've got such a different take on it. Mm -hmm. It's hard to put that in a short story because you got to explain all that before you can get to the mystery. So it was originally written for a different market, but it was too long for the market. Hmm. because to explain the mystery and the fact that there's a walking talking skeleton you know if i were ever like wildly famous with the character i could just say sid the skeleton and people would know who it meant but yeah that's i'm not there that's that's a real tricky thing isn't it after you uh with, whether you're starting a series or you're in the middle of it, it's like how do you bring everyone who might not have encountered the character up to speed and that's that's a real trick and how do you how do you handle that i mean you started Tony, you started writing just the novel to establish Sid, but there are, is there other uh, means by which you would in introduce a long-standing uh, character and verse in just a few words in the beginning of a, of a, of a new book? Well, with Sid, it works out well because um, I don't explain how he became a walking, talking skeleton. I mean, there's, there is no explanation. It wouldn't make any sense. So I just don't go there. Um, and so that takes a lot of time, really. <laughs> <laughs> just avoid it all together backstory, no backstory nope nothing but that you can see right through them um because you know no skin and um it, it, it's always trying not to use the same words i used before and i have to go back and forth and i think readers especially if they don't read it all at one time you know if they don't go through the series and a, and a thing they don't they don't notice it's only mm -hmm. when i read a lot of the same books in the same series that i notice yeah she's calling him the same thing she did last time i'll just fuzz back that part there's no other way he says that he's got jet black hair as in to say yes he's got jet black hair we got gotcha. you gotcha how about you charlene does anybody wear jet anymore i mean i can see that in victorian times when women wore jet uh jewelry for mourning but you're talking but, about like, how do people recognize that it's, it's, yeah. black, it's black plastic, isn't it? Is jet a thing? Is it a oh, stone? it's it's a it's a a jewel grade uh, form of coal, basically. <laughs> you know, it's uh it is it is a uh, it is a stone, or it, or it is a a natural thing, and we've come to the end of my uh, geology memory. <laughs> 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 a lot of it comes from the northeast of England, but, but yeah. But I mean, how do people know what jet black hair is these days? Is it black like a, a jet airplane that is uh, that Elon Musk owns? There was one book that kept referring to someone saying he looked like a young version of Joe Hardy, and I know Joe Hardy's one of the Hardy brothers, but I kept picturing Andy Hardy. That was really not the look she was going. <laughs> And of course, anyone you know younger than me, which is most of the world, would not know who the heck Andy Hardy is either. Oh, it's it's tough. So how how do you bring um how do you bring readers up to speed, Charlene? Is there a trick that you have, or oh, do tell us because I think we can. All <laughs> <use>. <laughs> I, I don't 
I try not to overwhelm people with descriptions of how people look or reminders of the past, the backstory. That's burdening the reader. Uh, I've had readers who are really quite upset with me because they said, you just told us all that stuff and everybody's read all the books in the series and we already know that. And I thought, would that that were true? (laughs) (laughs) Would that everyone had memorized my book so well that I did not need to uh, explain who people were at all. But sadly, that is not the fact. And it does help to give people a little tip off, but not so much that it's like a paragraph of, let me catch you up, you right. know? Yep. I guess you kind of have to go for the same thing as you do with anything in the book. Make sure you need it. Mm-hmm. Yes. Like, you don't need yeah. to say someone's got gray hair if they're only got <laughs> seven minutes. Just say, she's old and move on. You know, <laughs> the, the details won't matter. We're so familiar with that. <laughs> I don't. My hair's naturally purple. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. It's it's funny because um, one of my favorite instances when someone says uh, on Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Slayer, which I know we all love, um, when someone says, "Wait, Oz, you're a vampire," and someone says, "No, don't worry about it. It's a long story." And he goes, "I got bit." It's one of those. Was class- that was Oz. What how did Oz I say? Became, it was how Oz became a werewolf. Right. What did, did I not say Oz? No, you said vampire. Oh. Gosh, I'm a silly dilly. But yes, I just thought that was a great thing of of cutting right to the chase. Like, yeah, I got bit. It's not that big a story. But um, I I guess in terms, I'm trying to remember, I I tested out the Fangborn and stories for y'all. And I I came up with Zoe afterwards because I needed a different sort of protagonist. I realized that Jerry wasn't going to do it. And I needed someone who was from outside the Fangborn family. And in terms of exit interview... I wrote I wrote the first draft of the as the novel all, ages ago, and y'all 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 were there for we it. We know, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but then I realized, oh well. In the meantime, while I'm looking to get it published, I'll write these short stories. So I just there used to be there were places that like, oh, I could have someone who had a very uh, particular point of view and a certain familiarity familiarity and uh, predilection for violence, and I could use her here, and so just the stories came up and I sort of did more delving into her character. And that's ultimately what fed into the final draft, I think between her and, um, and the character I refer to as, as Raven, um, uh, Nicole, and it's just getting the hang of them through their interaction in the short stories ultimately affected the last draft. So I really, it actually worked out uh, well in terms of increasing the depth of the characterization for me with that. But I like to take, I mean, Anna Hoyt started out as a short story and with any luck, that novel will be out next year. My, my 18th century tavern owner, who is also a problem solver and usually manages to solve all of her own problems. And, <laughs> the uh, problems are all hers. <laughs> in a very direct <laughs> and, uh, laugh. Always a song on her lips. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, she's, she's uh trippingly, uh, you know, light of heart and uh, free of fancy. <laughs> um, I have to say that one of my, when we're talking about mashing up and not just jumping from genre to genre, but mashing some genres up, I always have fun because it always reminds me of the line from from Hamlet um, when Polonius is talking about the actors who are coming in to put on the play. And um, because I like all the hyphenations in here, for example, uh, he says that the, the the best actors the they are the best actors in the world either for tragedy, comedy, history, pastoral, pastoral comical, historical pastoral, tragical historical, tragical comical historical pastoral, scene individual, or poetry unlimited, or poem unlimited, and I always like that because I'm I have sort of a running tally of where I have the most hyphenates in a <laughs> in a in a mashup of genres that I've used, and I think. Um, I think the one where I've mashed up the most is probably either uh, the Curious Case of Amelia Verne, which is mashing up historical Victorian fiction, Sherlockian pastiche, and the Fangborn, or it could be episode four, Raven and the Cave Girl versus Dan Mammon, which is comic books, uh, thriller, and real people. Um, so I was wondering if you had, if you had 
a a short story or a, a novel where you mashed up the most um the most genres at once oh yeah the gunny rose books yeah alternate history yeah. america uh with magic america. and romance and a very different society from the one that actually pertained to then. Yes. I can't it, really hyphenate that, but, you know. <laughs> so I'm, I'm thinking it's at least pastoral, historical, uh, violentical, you know, violentical. Yeah, violentical. <laughs> magical, because there's magic. Yep. magic. Yeah. There he is. Yeah. How about you, Tony? Um, I squeezed the most, I think, oddly enough, into a short story also. It was, I did a short story for our anthology, Wolves, Bane, and Mistletoe. So it was a werewolf. It was a, a teen kind of coming of age story. There was a, there was a crime in it. And, um, and it also links to um, Christmas specials and also the Christmas story. I mean, the, the traditional Christmas story oh. with a werewolf, which almost everyone else who did a story in that was avoiding the whole religious aspect of Christmas. And it's like, and I stuck my foot right in it. So I think I matched up the most in that one little story. Mm -hmm. it, 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 it had a lot going on, and it worked. Thank you. Oh. Uh, sorry, Charlene, you looked like he was about to say something. I was. Uh, I was wanting to know from you why you decided to write a what's essentially a thriller. And why you wanted three female protagonists, which I just love. We Tony and I have loved this book through all the incarnations it's had. It's had many and incarnations. We're still big fans. <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Um, the short answer is I, I keep going back to the movie G.I. Jane. Um, yeah. when she when, when um, the protagonist is in getting stitched up by the doctor, she said, So why did, did you want to be? And I think it was a seal. Is that the training she's doing? And uh she says, What do you you know, uh, what do the guys say when you ask them that? And and the doctor says, I want to blow shit up. And basically, I wanted to go for that ride uh, on a thriller uh, as, you know, as one of the protagonists. It's I love thrillers because I love that thing where you feel that the main character is supremely competent and confident in what they're doing. I, I second guess myself all the time. I think so many of us, I mean, especially writers, do second guess ourselves. And to hang out with Jane, who second guesses nothing <laughs> and believes 100% in what she's doing, was kind of refreshing. She also terrifies me. She's a, she's a character who is um, someone I would have a difficult time with in real life. Yeah. But if you want to go on that adventure, you want to go with someone who you know is going to take you through dangerous things uh safely and successfully and maybe with a little flair and so i kind of liked i mean emma as an archaeologist in my emma Fielder books was was always i mean with an amateur sleuth you have someone saying gosh should i even be investigating this or what if the murderer did the right thing but uh, did the wrong thing for the right reasons what if the murderer was justified because all that kind of goes on with that and i uh with a traditional mystery with an amateur sleuth and i thought It'd be fun to just like just blow some stuff up and 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 study all sorts of mixed martial arts and 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 uh, handguns and other things. I my browser history had an alarming amount of of um, <laughs> of searches for shaped charges and explosions, and I'm like, okay, this is the thing where we have to <laughs> say for fictional purposes, I'm interested in. <laughs> you, you made a, a you kind of mixed both the, the hyper. Um, competent uh jane you know like a like a jack reacher character mm -hmm. and then kind of the harlan ellison normal man stuck in the middle of a thriller setting with your your reporter character whose name i can't remember because i'm it's amy yeah thank you as amy it's that you know you kind of got the best of both worlds those are kind of the, the two schools of thrillers the way i see them and a little bit of the techno thriller from your third character thrown in there thank you so I, uh... and all the three Main yeah. powerful threads of thriller them all in Three one book. facets of the yeah. same. Person. Facets. We're all about facets. <laughs> facets. We're faceted as, faceted as as F. 
as uh, as foretold. <laughs> as foretold. That's suspicious. That's us. Yeah. Uh, no, I thank you. I, I I wanted to have that philosophical tension between Amy, who's a reporter, and Jane, who uh, has a mission according to herself. And then have Nicole, who is on the more technological side of things, say, why are you bothering doing all this brutal killing when you could do something so simply through the internet and never be seen? And she has this uh, elegance and aesthetics to her that I I really, I quite liked and quite aspired to. I like her her way of looking at the world. And I liked having those that different range of perspectives. And I just, frankly, I wanted to have women in uh, the roles that you generally see men in. You know, it's... Uh, it's the reason I think a lot of us wrote um, or, or wanted to write high fantasy because we grew up with Tolkien. It's like, yeah, but where are all the women? You know, where are all the people of different colors? Where Where is everyone? Um, and that gets, it, it, I just wanted to do that. I'm like, yeah, we have room for that. I could have the women playing uh, the roles you usually, usually see men in. But I also want to avoid some of the tropes because if you watch like Salt, for example, yeah, there's inevitably... Um, Angelina Jolie, I, I could almost count off the beats. Like she's going to avenge her husband or her father. Bingo. Um, she's going to have a moment with a kid and a pet. And the pet happens to be a dog and a, and a spider, which I, you know, I could have done without. But you can almost count those beats. And I'm like, no, I just want someone who is there to do a job because she believes in it. And whether that's Amy or Jane or Nicole, um, I just wanted to be on that ride. And it was fun. Um, because they did have so much tension amongst them. That was uh, that was fun for me. And we've come to a complete stop. <laughs> well, uh, something you said earlier prompted uh, me to think, have we ever read a conventional mystery where at the end of it, the amateur sleuth thinks the murder was c completely justified in, in bumping off the person and goes, you know, good job. I know I wrote one of the Emma books where there was a, a murder that had been hidden for 60 years and that was justified. And she had to uh -huh. decide whether she was going to go and go to the authorities with it or not. But ultimately the other murders were <laughs> more problematic is not the, really the best way to explain it. Were, were more cut and dried. Um, like this was definitely a bad thing done for the wrong reason. Uh-huh. But that's an interesting thought. It's like, the, I don't think of a mystery. I think of, um, was it Trifles? It's a play by S Susan Gaspel? Glaspel? Not remembering it, but it's it's old one. And it's, you know, someone, uh, women are cleaning up the house after their, um, after a murder. And they realize who did it based on the trifles that were left behind. Sure. And, and they don't, and they decide not to say anything about it because... It was it was uh, the one thing that we could you know that could be done. Yeah, I was thinking about um, recently we read Gaudy Night by mm. Sayers, Peter Whimsey, and in it he's trying to get some information out of people by posing a situation. He describes the situations in a previous book in which a woman had killed an old woman who was going to be dying soon anyway. She was going to inherit all the money just a few weeks sooner. Nobody was hurt by this. But after she was, you know, that he started chasing her for the, committing that first murder, she then committed other murders to mm. cover her tracks. And he's just like, if I had left well enough alone, an old lady would have died. An old sick lady, an unhappy lady in pain would have died a few weeks sooner. And it would have made no difference. <laughs> my investigating, did I get people killed instead? Ooh, and like, you nice. Know, and, and kind of the sense that the first one, if not justifiable, it, like it's like, but it wasn't that bad. <laughs> she was gonna die anyway <laughs> oh i don't know i think we're kind of close and i mean there are our, our sherlockian short stories where he basically kills someone and says well no one is gonna miss him anyway which is very uh, you know cavalier <laughs> i think yeah, the, the blackmail or whatever his name was uh, yeah um, milverton, milverton. Uh, but there's a couple others where he actually does the killing mm. um and says well no one's gonna worry about him so we we're not gonna say anything <laughs> <laughs> no angst for me no thank you <laughs> least said soonest mended 
he probably has that as a sampler over his over his uh, <laughs> just so um when it comes to mashing up genres how do you balance honoring the different tropes of the genres you're blending or do you just say no i'm throwing it all out the door I don't know the ones that work for me. I'm not going to uh, adapt what needs to happen in my book to a trope that someone else has established. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's worth just saying, in my world, that's not how it is. <laughs> in my world, ice cream is all green. Or, you know, uh, in my world, that's just not how it works. Uh, and yeah, definitely kind of what works for you. And also, I spend a lot of my time trying to figure out something that someone hasn't done three billion mm. times, or at least that I haven't seen three billion times, which is not the same. Um, and so I kind of try to, you try to avoid tropes, and you can't, because you think you've avoided them, and then you go and find, oh, shoot, that was a different trope. Darn it. <laughs> <laughs> so I think I find the tropes more in retrospect than I do when I'm working. I mean, when working, it's trying to avoid things that seem too easy and too familiar once it's done it's like oh yeah that is that kind of trope isn't it dang it it's um i i find it tricky i mean i've told the story and you guys could probably recite it from memory about when you asked me to write my first werewolf story not knowing not having any reference books about werewolves and where do i start if i don't have reference books i'm sorry don't laugh it's sad <laughs> Did you go to your reference shelf to look for your werewolf books, Dana? I did. I do now because I have a bunch. But... <laughs> it's you know I'd written six novels and yet I'm think I wasn't thinking. Hey, wait, this is fiction. I can make this up, whatever. But I just I I took a lot of them and the tropes and flipped them on their head. But um, I think it's always interesting because people say, "Well, wait," but we're expecting this, and you have to. I don't know. Maybe you can just say it's how it is in my world, or maybe you have to say people say this about our type of creature, but this is the truth or something. And it's um, yeah. sometimes I feel like spelling it out is the easiest thing. And vampires and werewolves always fighting. It's like suddenly become a trope. I think it's because with, with with vampires there are a lot more tropes. With werewolves they're a lot fuzzier. Haha. -ha. Um, or maybe furrier um <laughs> you know we, we've all got you know we've got dracula and then we've got a few other more modern very touchstone things for vampires there aren't as many for werewolves i mean there's the wolfman movie which is i'm sorry it's not very good and lon Chaney jr bless his heart is not very good actor uh oh the bless his and heart and we know and we know what that is you gotta help me god you gotta and it's like <laughs> yeah um and so there's no sense i mean there's a few few gimmicks but there's not as many tropes with werewolves i think you can get away with a lot with shapeshifters mm -hmm. yeah I, that was one of the things i realized oh it's mostly film that we get the tropes about werewolves from unless you go back to um baron gould and his study of old folk culture and everything like that um i was just not reading that recently yes yeah <laughs> It's like, well, now I told you, I have a reference section on werewolves now. <laughs> I have a big old section on werewolves and vampires and, and all sorts of uh, su supernatural creatures from all around the world. Because uh, that's how you think. I was just looking to see if there's any questions from the audience, because if there are not, then I will start to wrap things up. Unless you have questions. Tony, Charlene, do you have any questions? <laughs> Ooh, I don't think so. Uh, well, how about this then? Why don't I say, what are you working on now? What is out now? And tell me something that's that's uh, wonderful in your in your in your career and your life. Say them slowly, Charlene. What, what's out okay. now? <laughs> okay, okay. Um, just out uh, two or three weeks ago is the Serpent in Heaven the fourth book in the Gunny Rose series, but told from the point of view of uh, Gunny's sister, Felicia, who is in the Gregory Rasputin School in San Diego mm -hmm. in the Holy Russian Empire. Yep. And the fifth book has been turned in. It's going to be called All the Dead Shall Weep. 
I know. I know. Gosh, I'm loving. I'm I'm having a title renaissance. <laughs> And pretty soon I'll be starting work on the sixth one. I have no title for that yet. Right now I'm writing an Andy Witt short story. Oh, fun. We love her. Uh, and, uh, oh, we have a question. What is a theme that you haven't played with yet that excite you, uh, that excites you as a writer? Oh, is there I want to, I want to scare people so bad. <laughs> I could write something as scary as, as the haunting of Hill House, that mm -hmm. would just be so wonderful. But I don't think that's going to happen. I don't think I'm that scary. I bet you could be. I bet you have it deep inside. I'll have to excavate a little more deeply then. <laughs> it's yeah, very scary when you're miffed. I believe I heard that mentioned recently. Yes, this is so true. So <laughs> true. How about you, Tony? Is there something that you're, you'd are you love to try writing that you haven't? Well, I'm working kind of on a, a caper idea because I really like the kind of capers and, and heists you see in like the show Leverage and the show Leverage Redemption and even the going back to the sting. So I'm working on a capers because mm. trying to figure out what puts them together and how they work. And it's like I kind of understand how they're in, um, how they work in movies and TV, but it's different when you're writing. I mean, they just, and it's, it's uh, creating the, the cast of characters and getting a whole bunch of characters, which you kind of need for a heist, and getting them colorful enough for it to work has been the challenge so far. And that is something that you're actually working on now? Yeah. Oh, cool. So cool. I would have answered this. I, I, would, I love capers, uh, you know, Oceans 11, Oceans 12. The Sting, you mentioned The Sting. You know, it's, oh, yeah. I love them. But I don't think I would ever have the the mathematical mind it takes to create something like that. And I think you're right that having it as a, a movie makes it a lot easier because you don't have to feel, meanwhile, so-and-so was off doing this. And so-and-so was doing this other thing, but running into a problem over here. Yeah. And so, but I... Well, you know, Westlake did a uh, heist novel, so I've been rereading yeah. some and Scott Lynch did some fantasy heist stuff. So th there's a few examples out there, but you know, setting it also setting it among high school parents because why not? <laughs> why not? Yep. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, let's see. Uh, Paul McNamee says you might want to read Vegas Heist by Van Allen Plexico. Thank you. <laughs> it's in the comments, and thank you, Regina, for that for that question. Uh, I am going to wrap it up now. Uh, Thank you so much for coming um, to to talk about genre with me. And I'm, I'm always glad to see you, my friends. Uh, and we're doing this because excellent view. Yay! 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 At long last with three female characters and all kinds of blowing up stuff. And as I directed the art, the art, uh, the cover was by Eric Nunley, who's fabulous. Um, yeah. I said, I want 20% more conflagration on it because I wanted people to know. That's what this is about. Anyway, thank you so much. It's always a joy. And um, we'll be able to uh, look at this on YouTube after this so we can go back and, and reminisce over the wonderful answers we gave. <laughs> <laughs> or I can say, why the hell did I say that? I always <laughs> I'll say, why the hell did Charlene say that? <laughs> why did she say that? <laughs> That's going to be my next sampler, my next cross stitch. Is why the <laughs> hell did Charlene say that? <laughs> All right. Well, thank you all so much. And thank you for, for uh, you know, you viewers who have come and, and, and given us great questions and comments while we're here. Appreciate it. So night, everyone. Night. 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 night.